Okay, let me just check. I've got Logic running. I've got the camera running. Okay. I went to the USSR in 1989. In 1989, it was kind of, kind of big year for me, music wise. I'd always loved music so much, but that year, there was a couple of seminal albums that were released that kind of shaped me and how I made music from there on. The first one, was New Order Technique, which I still adore New Order to this day, and I played that album to death. And the other one was the Stone Roses' first album, and it was kind of really the start of that Manchester dance indie guitar crossover. And yeah, I mean, that has influenced me, the way I've written music and produced music ever since. Um, initially, I was an indie kid. I just used to love indie bands. Um, but by 1989, there was certainly dance music coming around, hitting the UK. Um, a lot of the, the first stuff was Balearic stuff, coming over from IP from the DJs, and bands like the Finney Tribe, 808 State. Um, and all of a sudden I was kind of thinking maybe, maybe guitar music isn't the only music and, you know, I embraced dance music and electronic music and everything that came with that. Um, we were going out partying, having fun, listening to four to the floor beats and, you know, living it large. Britain in the late 80s, we were still under a conservative government and things were still pretty grim. Um, but you know, there was some amazing music around and you know, the UK has always had a really good pedigree of music. The reason the music and the art was so good is because it was a backlash against our own establishment. I mean, you wouldn't have had punk rock if it probably wasn't for, you know, conservatism and Thatcherism and stuff like this so I was just exploring and finding myself really um, and a trip to the USSR was you know all part of that journey. I think they the opportunity became from looking at an advert in the back of the Morning Star which was the socialist paper in the UK the route of our USSR trip, we flew from London to Moscow, then from Moscow onto Leningrad, then from Leningrad to Georgia, then onto Armenia, and ended up back in Moscow, and then back to London. I had come from a family who were, had socialist tendencies, um, right back to my grandfather who was a trade unionist and my father and you know they kind of leaned that way which was very unusual for families in the UK um, we were definitely the odd family my dad used to buy Eastern European larder cars and things like this I didn't really understand communism that much but it seemed it was for the people or that in theory it was for the people and you know, power to the people. Um, so yeah, it was it was interesting to go and see it for myself. My parents used to have lots of revolutionary images around the house, so maybe in my mind I thought it was, you know, the big strong workers of Russia, you know, ran the country. So yeah, it was a bizarre place to go. It was, you know, America's further away. USSR, well, it's it like four, five hours on a plane, maybe less, but it seemed like a million miles away. It was, it kind of seemed like out of space to us. The journey started at Heathrow Airport and my first ever impression of life in the USSR was when an Aeroflot plane turned up and 
you know, I was looking around the, the airport lounge, looking out the window, and I saw your VA planes, your Virgin Atlantic planes. And then all of a sudden, this plane, it did look like a Cold War relic, almost. Even the plane looked dull. Um, so we got on the plane. Um, it's, that's when things started to go a little bit strange. Um, they didn't really have much regard for safety. <laughs> it seemed like, I seem to remember them serving alcoholic drinks before the plane took off. And I think they may have even been serving vodka as the plane was taking off. I might have imagined this, but it's, uh, yeah, it, see, it did seem, it did seem, okay, things are different. It kind of hit me, the brutalism of the architecture. Everything was kind of square, grey, dull, sharp angles. It seemed a bit joyless. I didn't notice much colour. We stayed in Moscow. We stayed at a hotel for a couple of days. Um, I was shocked by the food, I guess. Western diet of burger and chips, processed food, and then all of a sudden to get presented at breakfast time with um, caviar, which I guess is a you know supposed to be a luxury, isn't it? But you know caviar, and then being given cabbage soup, um, it, that was a real culture shock. The last impressions is the subway stations. I don't know if we got taken to some really nice ones, but the ones in Moscow were like palaces. No, I think they even had chandeliers. Compared to a, a British London tube station, and people were still smoking on the tubes in them days, um, which was really great, dirty, dark, smelly, and small. And I remember the Moscow ones were sort of, you know, you come down the escalators and it was like, wow, where are we? But after Moscow, we travelled by train for what seems the longest journey on a train I'd ever taken in my life. Um, I think it was like 10, 12 hours or something. I mean, the UK is a pretty small country. You can get from one end to the other end. Um, and we were just heading to the, a, another city. I remember the station was beautiful. But once we got on the train, it was kind of kind of reminded me of something from the early 70s in the UK. It was very basic. It was a rickety old ride. Kind of fell in love with Leningrad. It, the, the buildings were beautiful. Um, all of a sudden there seemed like there's some colour. Um, there was some beautiful, like the Winter Palace. Things like this. So it did have a completely different feel. It felt like a different country, to be honest with you. So I think we went to the Alley, um, and which was, you know, the thing to do, the world-renowned Alley, which must be the best in the world, and is the best in the world. And we went and saw the Red Army sing, Red Army Choir, um, which was great. It did feel like we were just shown the creme de creme of like the cities and what was you know what people wanted us to see one of the most striking things when I got to Leningrad it was cold I think we went in the autumn so it wasn't summer I remember staring out the hotel window and watching huge icebergs floating down the river um, which again was kind of mind blowing and stuff I hadn't seen before. After Leningrad, we headed off to Black Sea, Georgia, which we were told was a holiday destination for people in Russia at that time. And I remember that was beautiful. It still wasn't Benidorm or Spain, but you know, it was kind of, it was a seaside resort. And then after that, we headed to Armenia, where I was at a stage where I didn't really want to hang out with my parents. And I went with my older brother, so we were 
um, going off, meeting, chatting to people. We met a couple of really sweet guys who kind of befriended us. They were intrigued by us. We were intrigued by them. So we got invited back to their high rise flats on the outskirts of the town. And I remember the mother made us some food and we sat with them all night drinking and smoking and just chatting and, you know, just, you know, quizzing each other about each other's countries. And, you know, they were fascinated by the West and we kind of, you know, we felt like we were kind of getting to know the USSR a little bit by meeting real people and hanging out and chatting and getting drunk and, you know, things teenage kids do, you know, wherever they're from. One thing that we did purchase, or we were interested in getting hold of, and we did some swaps for things, was old Russian USSR army memorabilia. So my brother came back with a proper Russian hat, and we had stars, and I think we had some sort of Russian like medals and things like that. Anything to do with the USSR, hammer and sickles and that were really cool because you, you could just couldn't get it in the UK. Uh, we could probably get cheap copies, but this was the real deal. We were kind of limited on the exchange front. I think we could only do one for one and there was a limit on how much money. I think we had to uh, clarify how much money we, we were bringing into the country and how we were spending it, I guess. Um, but we were kind of out one day and we were approached by some people, some kids, and says, do you want to swap your dollars? And we were like, yeah, okay. And they were often offering 10 to one, um, which was brilliant. I'd kind of been told that it was totally illegal. And if we did it, we'd get in real trouble. But you know, we're, you know we're, we're punk rock. We don't care about getting in trouble. So we, um, we exchanged some money on the black market. And then at one point I had, I took some 501 jeans with me, some Levi's and I managed to, I think I might've done a swap actually. I might, might have just given them away for absolutely nothing just cause the person wanted these Levi jeans. So I gave a pair of Levi jeans away. So I did smoke at the time and I used to smoke Marlboro Reds just because that was cool. And cowboys used to smoke it and rock and roll. But uh, I remember I needed to buy cigarettes in Russia and the, the cigarettes were disgusting, really strong. There was certainly lots of alcohol involved. <laughs> it seemed like vodka was a national pastime. Doing shots of vodka you know, at 10 a.m. in the morning was an, was a, an experience. Good though. Grown up through the 70s and 80s, through the nuclear arms race, and you know, it's pretty sad that Russia, they were thought of as the enemy. And this is what we were told. These people, they are bad. Their country is bad. The way their country is run is bad. Um, you know, thankfully, we always question things, um, not just having a socialist background, but as a musician, a creative person, you know, we, we were not down with the establishment of where we lived, you know, and if the establishment, and we didn't really trust them, were telling us, no, these people are the enemy. And, you know, deep down inside, we were thinking, well, maybe they're not the enemy, maybe you're the enemy. And, you know, propaganda, I know, you know, Russia's really famous for its propaganda, but it happens here as well. It did feel like change was in the air, which is really strange because I was thinking, well, this is kind of, this is the way, isn't it? But no, people wanted change. I thought that that was the way the country was going to run. And, you know, it seemed like it was working apart from it being quite grim um but it i was always told that the alternative was worse you know when the czars were there and then the peasants and 
you know this was people almost having their freedom but when I did go there it was pretty you know I was kind of glad to get back to the UK and you know people you know maybe that freedom wasn't there so I mean my mum and dad had this idea and they were kids of the 60s remember 50s and 60s so they'd grown up with this communist ideology of you know sharing you know the wealth and people have the power and you know which is brilliant um whether they got to the ussr and may have seen the reality um it didn't really seem like there was much fun going on and it did seem like people were quite you know depressed really which is a shame um maybe the idea was great but in practice maybe the way that it was executed didn't really work well it obviously didn't work because it collapsed but my dad he would never change his views he you know he hated capitalism and, and the us and stuff like that so you know you know russia was always the motherland and he was you know he you know he thought that was the way yeah overall i mean we went for two weeks it's all a little bit of a blur because it was the late 80s and you know i was kind of finding myself and i was a young man myself and you know um but yeah it was an amazing experience <laughs>